I'm Santo Chilaro, screen comic, football tragic, or that'd be soccer tragic for the unconverted. Tonight's story is about Ange Postacoglu, the national coach who earlier this year silenced the naysayers and led our struggling Socceroos to their biggest victory ever, the Asian Cup, capturing the hearts and dreams of us all. This is his story. Ange is a hard ass and, and he's tough and his management style is a little bit like lead, follow or get out of the way. Everyone's vulnerable. Everyone's got the ability to perform well, but also everyone has the, the fragility not to. So who's to say what's, what's going to be written out there today? In the last 10 years, the game has gone from forgotten game to unforgettable glory. He was the guy that decided that we could when everyone told us we couldn't. He was just driven because he loved the game. It wasn't the glory, the headlines, it wasn't the publicity, nothing like that. With him, it was always the game. He'll take on all the pressures of planning and, and training, but then the players get the chance to explode on the pitch. And create some history. That's what I love about sport, maybe it's what I love about life, is that no story is yet written. The right lines and pages, but the ability to, to change where that goes is in, in, in your own hands. thing with Ange, he doesn't say a lot, he doesn't make things comfortable for people and for a lot of people that's kind of unnerving. Whether you're on the training pitch or off it, he's watching. He stands there with his, with his arms like this and 100% you can feel something burning in the back of your head. You turn around and there he's staring at you so you know you don't know um, what he's thinking so you're always wanting to impress and try and earn your spot in the team. Ange was a Socceroo, so he was a very good player. But I reckon and he always knew that he'd be a better coach than he was a player. And, uh, and he had that ambition and that drive and that desire from a, a really early age. Wherever your football allegiance lies, the chances are, I think, that you've probably watched some soccer, possibly on television. It wasn't cool to play soccer when Ange and I were growing up. Yeah, it was pretty simply called either Kiss Chasey or Wog Ball. Kiss Chasey, you know, after the boys score a goal, everyone would be hugging and kissing, which, dare I say, they're doing that now in, in AFL for fun. Uh, and Wog Ball, because only the ethnics played it. I do feel that we have relied a little too much on the, the migrant population to produce our soccer crowd, and they have come to this country, and, of course, they want to follow the, the sport that they have grown up with. We grew up in Athens. Greece at the time wasn't a, a, a pleasant place to be. Dad had a business that unfortunately with the change in government and the military uh, moving in, he lost. You know, we came over here when I was five and, uh, you know, it was obviously a massive move. They obviously came here to give me and my sister a better life. Mum arriving here with just suitcases and not knowing anybody, having to care for two little children, it was very difficult for her. I remember many nights uh, um, hearing her crying. You kind of realise the sacrifices they made and why they made them and all I remember of my parents growing up is them working. As a kid I just wanted to fit in so I, I didn't necessarily like the fact that I came from another country and you know I had a, a really long surname that no one could sort of get their mouth around and I guess for a young boy the best way to fit in was sport. I remember this skinny kid with the blonde light hairs, which is very un-Greek, just absolutely fiercely darting in and just really competitive. And I remember thinking, oh, this kid's standing out. On a Sunday, there was two places of worship for anyone of Greek origin. In the morning, you'd go to church, and in the afternoon, you'd go to the football. South Melbourne was the club of the Greek community. The clubs were basically based around the ethnic groups, the immigrant communities. 
So basically the immigrants would work Monday to Friday in the factories, probably uh, under very hostile circumstances, and they formed these clubs to provide them with refuges on the weekends. These little clubs were really strong pillars in each community, just providing comfort and, and support to people who had made a pretty big decision to, um, to come to a new country. When Angel was old enough, Dad enrolled him at the junior development at South Melbourne. My father, he loved football and he, he'd drive me to training. We'd have half an hour in the car. You know, me and my dad was, you know, for, for a boy, that's what I was after. Very quickly, the whole game just consumed me from then on. He was like a sponge, so anything to do with soccer he absorbed. He would sit in on conversations with older people as they discussed it. He would uh, watch what little television there was in those days, uh, magazines, uh, books, stories, anything. Ricky Gray's knocked it in. Rovers have equalised. Goal! I just love reading about it, you know, whether it was about the managers or, um, you know, Q&As with players. Um, it took me to another world, to be fair. And I think it's why I keep them. Um, it just reminds me of what my childhood was sort of like. It was a lot of, uh, you know, living in a sort of a fantasy football world that didn't exist here in Australia. Any right? Yeah, to run forward, just chipping that one inside, looking there for Trimboli. It's Postacoglu, and there's the equaliser from Angelo Postacoglu. I first spotted Ange when, in the mid-'80s, he came through as a young player with South Melbourne, and he had a long mullet flying behind his head as he galloped up the field. He was an attacking player, very, very quick. Right with the cross, Postacoglu with the header, Angelo Postacoglu. When I turned up, he was already uh, captain of the club at 21. That's his fourth goal of the year. South Melbourne had a massive expectation. The Greeks would pack in there, and God forbid if we drew a game or lost a game, it was expected you had to win, but you had to win in a certain manner. You need to uh, play exciting football. You need to always play an aggressive attack. And soccer was expected of you. A dangerous play from Angie Postacoglu. And he went on to have a terrific career there. He captained the Tour Championship, played in a couple of championships as a, as a player. South Melbourne, the National League champions for the second time. And then went on to coach at South Melbourne as well. And then going on to be, you know, a really, you know, a legend of the, of the club. We'll see everyone back at the South Melbourne Social Club, OK? Well done. I met Ange at work. He was the senior coach of South Melbourne Soccer Club at the time. And I was the club's um, marketing manager. Initially, I wondered why everybody around him and around the club was so fascinated and respected him because he's not someone that I would describe as charismatic or he probably will hate me saying this, but <laughs> a charmer. Yeah, we get sick of this. <laughs> nah, it's all good. I didn't get it. But then only afterwards I got to understand, you know, him as a person and... He'd see him on the ground. He'd strike conversations with kids because he saw them, how much they were enjoying what he enjoyed and how much he loved the game. Is it the start of another dynasty? As a young coach, he was very successful in the old National Soccer League. He won two championships with South Melbourne. And in 1999, we won the right to compete in the World Club Championships where the best clubs from each continent would play each other in a tournament. It was South's last hit out before the World Club Championships in Brazil, where the defending NSL champs face three of football's big guns, including glamour English club Manchester United. It's going to be tough, I mean, for a team from Melbourne to be playing those, you know, calibre teams, but hey, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity, isn't it? So how does that happen, you know? It's like a real unique set of circumstances. Yeah, You're playing in shirts that literally cost 10 bucks against Manchester United, <laughs> David Beckham. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. We are playing, we were losing, but we were trying to make a bit of a late rally. And I'm running around and I'm thinking, <laughs> where's everyone? I look over. It's about three guys just circling yeah, around, around Beckham, Beckham. Waiting for the final waiting whistle. Waiting for the final whistle so they can <laughs> stop shooting. South Melbourne playing the better play, the better football. Dan's embraced it and uh, it certainly sent the boys out and we didn't disgrace ourselves at all. We were more than competitive for most of the game. There's the uh, Australian coach. It was kind of the, yeah, the, the seminal moment where I stared down the beast. After that, I had nothing to fear. 
Well, after the successes of South Melbourne, Ange was eventually offered to coach the Australian youth teams. I would now get to challenge myself internationally, not just you know, domestically, and I was looking forward to it. He was basically given the keys to that kingdom and turned up and uh, realised it was, you know, a wreck because the National Soccer League was on its last legs. The support structures required to actually do that job, particularly in a development role, were probably not there for him. By 2005, I didn't coach well because I started worrying about all this pressure that was intensifying over the fact that we hadn't got results at youth level for a few years. I was close with him um, during those difficult times where he was copying a lot of criticism. And if anything, I probably acted a little bit of a sounding board. My previous marriage had finished years ago and um, George, she's a real positive person and I kind of needed that because it just seemed like, um, you know, there was, as I said, a lot of uncertainty, almost a dark, dark cloud over where I was heading in, in a professional sense. In late 2006, Ange Postacoglu's Australian youth team failed to qualify for the World Cup, now for the second time. Thanks for joining us. We invited Ange onto the World Game program to be interviewed not just by me, but by my colleague, Craig Foster. You're paid Why to do you keep saying a point to the players? You're obviously not listening to me, mate. So I remember Craig telling me, I'm going to grill him. You know, he can't get away with this. And uh, I said, well, you know go for your life <laughs> and he did and he did yeah, but you, you I mean you can't just point to the players you've got to take responsibility yourself don't you the interview with Craig went out live and uh, it's become a bit of a iconic event in Australian football television history football I don't, I don't league, sit in glass houses our mate. I'm out there. Well, mate, listen if I what I'm saying is if I didn't qualify the team twice there? like you I'd put my hand up and I'd yeah. walk out because that would happen in most other well I think the one point that kind of set me off was, you know, he was asking me to resign. So you're saying I should resign? I think That's you should, your opinion, yeah. is that right? That's my opinion. Yeah, fine. I let it run. I got criticised for letting it run, but I, I, I felt the questions that were put to Ange required answers. Sorry? Are you going to resign then? That's the next question. And the producer's instinct in me told me that uh, it was very, very good television. I'm just oh, going so on your going. results, right? I'm not attacking you personally. Okay. I'm I know saying... you are. Yes, you... Well... OK, you're not attacking me personally. That's great. I feel much better because you're a really close mate. I don't oh, care what you think of me personally. We're not on you to be mates. I remember straight after doing it, that's all people wanted to talk about, that interview. And I thought, well, this is, is this what I'm going to be defined for now? For the first time, I heard him over the phone really distressed. Um, he was pretty upset and worried about how he was portrayed and what it looked like. The month later, we got married and three months later he got the sack. And that's not exactly the wedding gift I was anticipating or wanting. So things started to go downhill from then on. Suddenly he'd gone from the guy that could do no wrong to a guy you couldn't employ. An opportunity came to coach in Greece and uh, God bless her, Georgia said, look, you know, go for it and um, off we went. And that's no easy gig, that's a minefield. But that said to me that he was determined to learn, get better, and be the best coach he could be. When we got back from Greece, um, and still couldn't get a job. We didn't have a place to live, so we moved back with my mum for about six to eight months. <laughs> it was TV work that mainly sustained me, and then I was doing some bits and pieces with coaching kids and running clinics because I just wanted to keep coaching. Okay, we're on ever offsiders. We're straight out to camera four. I was worried for Ange. When you can't get the opportunity, it's frustrating. So I saw frustration. What I didn't see through any of that time at all, ever, and I've never seen with Ange, right, is him questioning his ability. It's amazing, uh, it's sure. amazing how many... Um how many times it does happen. In fact, that period of time, I think over, over a couple of years, what he developed was this real clear mindset on what he, want, what he wanted to do as soon as he got the opportunity. He knew exactly where he was going to take a team, how he was going to do it, and, and, and transform the way that football was being played. We were doing a broadcast and uh, half the game I was leaving in front of me, it was Archie Fraser, who was CEO of the A-League at the time. I just said to him, look, I'd love to have a crack. I'd love to, have to get back into coaching and I'm desperate. I think I've got something to offer. I knew him from South Melbourne days. I suppose I was surprised that Ange couldn't get a, a gig. And um, we just had a chat. 
Anyway, a couple of days later, um, we see on the news that Frank Farina, who was the head coach of Brisbane Roar at the time, had got picked up for drink driving. Ange received a phone call from Archie not long after that and said, is there any way you can get yourself to Brisbane? The next day, he jumped on the plane and went and met uh, the owners of Brisbane Roar at the time. You know, I said, I'm going to do things differently. You know, if, if you're happy with what you got, I'm not your person. And I sensed in them that they want to change as well. It wasn't a great six months when he first came. He did a big clean-out of our team. He moved on people that he thought didn't fit in at the club, and he brought in his own players. Last night, Brisbane Roar's week quickly moved from bad to worse. I wanted to leave a mark on part of that was even the way the game was played. We wanted to be an attacking team and that sat better with me as a person, my personality. No opportunity to make mistakes tonight. And it looked crazy for a while because they were awkward and they would get themselves in trouble. But they were absolutely determined to play on their own terms and play an attractive, exciting brand of football to entertain and to win games. Oh, it's one of the goals of the season! And eventually, it worked. It was brilliant to watch. Stunning stuff from the wall. The Brisbane Raw under Ange is the best Australian club team I've ever seen. Unbelievable! And this was music to my eyes. I mean, it was, it was the modern way of playing. Oh, it's scintillating football from Brisbane! In one particular sequence, the Raw under Ange was undefeated for 36 games. Now, this was even internationally unique. And who could stop the Brisbane Raw? And he had a fantastic run winning two championships in a row. And Brisbane Roar have won the grand final. Oh, yeah! They were just really, really happy times. And we had just gone through a really, you know, pretty shitty time in our lives uh, that lasted probably a lot longer than we both thought. Um, it just made the victory even sweeter. And lost the conference. By the second year at Raw, I was agitating for something different again. That was now my constant driver. So we moved back to Melbourne um, and Ange was the head coach of Melbourne Victory. At the Melbourne Victory, Ange Postacoglu was doing well. He was building a quality team. Uh, well, at the same time, the Socceroos were at the bottom of the toilet. There were two internationals played but Australia got slaughtered 6-0 in each of them. This morning's heavy defeat to France came after a devastating loss to Brazil only a few weeks ago. So they decided to sack the coach. When that, uh, the crash came in Paris for the Socceroos, there was quite apparent who the next Socceroos coach could be. There's only one, really, and that was Ange. I think today is a bloody, bloody good day. And he's on the mission with us to make this sport the largest and most popular in the country. The opportunity to coach a country. I didn't think this moment in time would come for me again. And yeah, I thought it was a time to take it. I was super excited for him to have the opportunity, but at the other side, all I could think about was, oh no, I'm never going to see my husband. <laughs> it's going to be very, very difficult again. It's quite lonely, but you know, at the same time, I knew that he was ready. Anyone under three foot is not allowed in here. <laughs> There's one thing I can definitely say, I wouldn't be where I am today without Georgia. I think uh, through that tough time, without her by my side, I'm not sure where I would have ended up. We hardly see Ange, and I, I remember even I was pregnant and um, Max came three weeks early. Ange was supposed to fly that day to London, and I said to him, you can't go. You're not leaving me to have this child on my own. You have to change your flight. Anyway, he did. He managed to change his flight and Max arrived and then the next day he left. And that's, that's how things work for us. Today, the Postacoglu plan for Brazil 2014 became clear. We want to reward form and, and fitness and, and also have an eye to the future. We had a World Cup and an Asia Cup in literally 12 months. I wanted to win the Asia Cup and every decision I made was geared towards that. I've always told you, if you're in any doubt, you go forward with the ball, just by yourselves. But first, they were going to a World Cup, and 
with the whole world watching, I couldn't not be competitive there. He basically said, OK, it was like a reality TV show. So you want to be a Socceroo? Let's see what you got. I think he tried around 49 to 55 players. He did his own research and, you know, started sourcing players from all over the world and scouting them himself. I remember him telling me he'd flown to um, England to see a particular player and his name was Mossimo Leongo. He eased me in quite, quite slowly, but I think he saw something enough for him to trust me to play. And, uh, yeah, I got there in the end, I think, yeah. I guess that's what I was looking for. I was you know, looking for sort of diamonds in the rough, so to speak. He loves that idea that he can take a young player and throw them in the deep end. Sometimes I think he took a perverse pleasure in seeing them rise to the occasion. Spain, the world champion. World champion in B1. B1. I set my alarm for, uh, I think it was four in the morning around then and uh, got up to watch the World Cup draw. Australia will play Chile. For the group C in the now. game with the new manager, Anish Postacoglu. We got drawn in what was the group of death. Now we're going up against the best in the world. He, um, he had it up against him, but knowing my dad, he was going to do something special. I have to admit, I thought, oh my God, how on earth are we going to beat any of these teams? And James, his son, actually sent him a text and said, this is fantastic. You know, the whole world's going to be watching your game. This is your time to shine. And I thought, that's exactly right. And that's the way I've approached everything in life. And, uh, you know, what others saw as something daunting, I saw as an opportunity to make the mark I've always wanted. And we almost did. Everyone expected a couple of tennis scores, six love, six love. Something in the team clicked. I think Ange had taught them to hold their nerve. World Cup was unbelievable. I knew exactly what I was doing. I knew what the team was doing. We played some of the best football. We kept the ball. We, we rattled teams, mentally, physically. It's 2-1 Australia. We lost three games, but that performance in Brazil made me very proud to be an Australian because their capacity to, to be willing to have a go and to be uh, uh, not fear anyone. And that's the way I expect Australian teams to play. He sat us down straight after the last World Cup game. He said, um, you know, look, at, you know, successful tournament. Um, you know, we did Australia proud, but our next aim now is the Asian Cup. The Asian Cup is no small beer. That's a, that's a serious tournament. Hey, being regional champions uh, is uh, something that you, a calling card that people take notice of. As well, the biggest ever football event to be held on these shores. I went to the first game when they played Kuwait. There's the opening goal from Hussein Final. They started slowly, but then by the end of it, you just sense that this team, they were ready to, they were ready to achieve something. Panic to check and deliver. Great ball in. And what a header. And it is Massimo Luongo. And then uh, they saw it right through to the final. And we're underway in the 2015 Asian Cup final between Australia and South Korea. I was in the stands and I was there with all our friends. It was just such a high and the emotions were, yeah, unbelievable. Tim Kale, beaten away by Kim jin Hyun. It was a very, very tight game. It was a stalemate. And suddenly this young man, Massimo Longo, lets fly with this scorching shot. Oh my goodness! The place went nuts. And uh, I thought, well, this Massimo Longo is not a bad pick uh, by the national coach. Postacoglu starts the pace. When the game was on and we were winning 1 0 and maybe two minutes to go, I sensed the whole stadium sort of just go quiet a little bit. And I think everyone was just waiting for that final whistle. And I got really uneasy. I just thought, something's going to happen. And I turned around and sort of tried to get the crowd going. Wow. He always waits till the final whistle before he celebrates any achievement or any win. So for him to do that, I got confidence. He gave me the belief that we've won it. And then a moment later, we cop a goal and they equalise with us. Here's the chance. Sergeant Bennett's on the ball. scored! And 
I just felt that the air had been sucked out of the stadium, not just the players, but every supporter in there. And as soon as they scored, pretty much the final whistle went. Liverpool will need extra time to separate the teams. You, know, you saw the, the look on everyone's face as uh, they worked so hard to, to hold the lead. It was heartbreaking. Yeah, it was just heads down, really, um, until we got over to the huddle. I looked over at the Koreans who were already sort of in their huddle and either getting massages or fluids. They'd given everything. And I looked over at my group, not one of them was on the ground, they were all standing. They were just waiting for me to talk to them and I just thought, wow, that's it, we've got them. And I just said to them, I walked over and I said, have a look. They're gone, they're finished. Just take it, take the moment. And when they left the huddle, the last thing I said was, this is going to make it a better ending. And there was never any doubt we were going to win it after that. Maybe even second time, still we go on. Juric has wriggled his way clear. That's the most I see Dad move when he starts celebrating it. It was a pretty good feeling seeing him running around, um, pumping his fists in the air, getting into it. I was a bit worried about his suit because he was he was stretching it out, but that's all right, yeah. It's a funny one in that, in that moment. You get a huge relief that, that's come to fruition, and then I just sit back and I just watch everyone else. I just I get a real buzz from seeing people celebrate you know, that, that have worked hard for it seeing the satisfaction in their faces and then, you know, your family, friends, Georgia, James, you know, they're, they're all in the stadium and you kind of look for their faces. It was for everybody. It was for everybody who'd ever put up a, a net, who put a corner flag, who carried water bottles. Uh, we get to hold the cup that particular night. I try and take it up because I know that the next day I'll move on. In that moment, I try and take as much in because I know that come the next day, I'm already thinking ahead. And it's not that he's not proud of his achievements. He so is. Like, he knows he's, he's done well, but he just thinks there's more out there. So what happened here? These two people um, from the Mavro Michalis family... Were... The Hellenic Museum put together an exhibition called Through a Child's Eyes, uh, which focuses on 12 very prominent uh, migrants that came here in the 60s and 70s as children. Okay, they're piercing, of course. And one of them being Ange Postacoglu. <laughs> Mum and Dad, they're elderly now, they're frail. <laughs> Two people that came with, with suitcases. It, it, it's a big thing for them. And to see mum's face, to see the, the joy in her face, priceless. As a kid, you know, everything I wanted, I had. Um, but my parents had to work very hard for it. It does affect you, and obviously that's a, a driver, a motivator to, to make the most of the opportunity that I've got. Hey, how are you? How are you, mate? And there's great expectation now. His success could be you know, his greatest uh, challenge, and that is to continue to replicate that time after time after time. Hey, sweetie, how are you? All right? Good, 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 good. You can be a Matilda, yeah, not just a soccer. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to win a World Cup. I think uh, most people would see that as a crazy statement right now, but I've got three years to go for it. You never know. Coffee after. Oh, no, no, no.